Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Haskane Hour. I'm Sandy Hershkovitz, Associate Dean of Research and Faculty at the Haskane School of Business. The Haskane Hour speaker series was launched in October of 2015. In Haskane Hour, we pair Haskane faculty with experts in the field to provide you with unique perspectives to influence your business strategy and practice. We are presenting from Calgary, which is located on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising Siksika, the Pikani, and Ga'aina First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the City of Calgary. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion today, and I'm happy to introduce our moderator, Nick Turner, Professor in Organizational Behavior and Human Resources and Distinguished Research Chair in Advanced Business Leadership at the Haskane School of Business. Nick will lead today's discussion and introduce our speakers. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning, everybody. Um, our, our leaders created, born, or maybe it's a bit of both. How do we know the right ones for the future? These are just a few of the questions that we're going to explore with you today. Um, and we're looking to keep the interactivity we had online in the last several years of online Haskane hours up to date. So several times throughout the session, uh, I'll look to you for questions both early on and then a couple of times as we progress and we explore these ideas together. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Andrea Robertson is the President and Chief Executive Officer of STARS Air Ambulance. In this role, she is responsible for the overall direction of operations and works to build relationships with donors, government, and key partners. Prior to STARS, Robertson spent nearly 30 years in a variety of healthcare leadership roles at Alberta Health Services, Foothills Medical Center, and Alberta's Children's Hospital. She's a member of the Board of Directors for the Calgary Airport Authority and Canadian Pacific Railway. Robertson was named a top 100 winner of the Women's Executive Network Canada's Most Powerful Women in 2014. Dr. Julie Weatherhead is an Assistant Professor of Organizational Behavior and Human Resources here at the Haskane School of Business. The primary focus of Julie's research is on varying aspects of leadership. She's involved in a longitudinal research study investigating the effects of social economic status on different aspects of leadership emergence and is attempting to better understand who becomes a leader and who does not. Welcome Andrew and Julie this morning. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, Andrea. Good morning, Julie. We're doing this. I yes. guess. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here at 7.30 a.m. Um, I'm really excited to have this, this conversation around leadership and who becomes a leader and how we can identify leaders. And I know when we first started talking, I asked you, when, when did you see yourself as a leader? Yeah, impossible to know, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, when did others we, see you as a leader? Well, you know, I think it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, I look at our own staff at STARS and I see all of them individually as leaders, honestly. And so I think that when you become specialists in your field, to some extent, you lead. And then the question is, is what do you want to do with your profession and your career? Uh, you clearly chose one path. I clearly chose a, a different path. Um, and then who makes a good leader? And I think that you and I can debate that um, over the, the course of the next hour for sure. I think we can. Uh, I think that mindset of seeing everyone as a leader is special and that that's not the case of, of all senior executives across the board. Um, I think for a lot of people, they, they don't see all of their employees as having that potential. So I appreciate that perspective uh, because I agree. I think that innately, everyone has the potential to be a leader. I don't know if everyone actually does become a leader, actually engages in those behaviors that make you leader-like. Um, do you think that just because every, you see them as leaders, do they actually step up to the plate as, as leaders? 
Well, you know, it, it might be an unusual function of, of what we do at STARS that would separate us maybe, uh, or make it a little different. So when I talk specifically about the air medical crew, there's no question in my mind that every single one of them leads, they're hired to do that. They're hired to think independently and, and uh, act independently and, and lead through crisis, right? So that's sort of the, the core role. So I would say yes, and, and that's also true in aviation and engineering. Those people have to make big decisions every day and lead through it. So I, I, I think uniquely and innately in what they do, um, that's required. So, you know, obviously not every place, uh, workplace is like that. Um, and we do need followers, right? Uh, you know, as we know. But I, I think that, you know, what we're going through is a tsunami again of change and maybe change is an overused word, right, Julia? You know, it is just a constant evolution these days. But I think we've been through a very unusual time in the last few years. And I think employers are facing things they've never faced before. And we're all still trying to work out and figure out what's effective, efficient use of our workforce uh, in this hybrid new model of, of working remotely and, and in person. Look at us this morning. We yes. were initially thinking that we would be together and here we are, again, virtual. So I think that, you know, will we have a, a leadership gap because of the last two years? Um, perhaps, you know, have we lost the time in these two years of mentorship and the natural leadership education that occurs in the workplace um, just through interaction? And so will we be a couple of years out and think we don't have people ready to take on these leadership roles? I think. I think that that might be an unintended consequence. I, there's so much in there. Um, I think there's the, the change versus crisis. Like I think people went through a crisis and now we're going through change, continued change. Um, so that's one aspect of it that we can, we can talk about because there's leadership that's required to deal with crises. Like you said, your team is maybe uniquely equipped with that because you handle crises far more frequently. Um, but then just this this change to how we how we lead who can be a good leader i don't know if there's going to be a two year gap i think leadership still has been happening and i think in some ways some people have shown exemplary leadership in the last two years they've allowed them like it's been a moment for them to shine um and so people have maybe seen that and, and felt like okay this is a space where i could be a leader in this way as well um, but you're right, I think some of the, within organizations, some of the systems that we have, that many organizations have to develop leaders was stalled uh, within the university setting, right? When you don't have the same amount of peer interaction, you have less practice influencing people. You have less practice motivating others. You're just not dealing with other people and, and dealing with other people is, is kind of key to leadership. So. I think there's the possibility of this gap, but maybe I'm a little bit more optimistic that there won't be a, a you're more optimistic. whole. You're, you're totally more optimistic than I am. I like the things that I worry about are things like the kids that didn't get to play sports, because I actually believe that that playing sports or traveling or all of those other things that didn't occur in, in that two year time frame, depending on what you're time of development is could have longer term you know implications and those things affect leadership i i believe and so you know that i just don't think that we know exactly what what just happened to us that and, that and i, I think we're, we're learning our way through it so i mean you and i talked about earlier you know th there were companies in calgary that said okay you know it's over everybody back to work and mandated it and then ended up with this reaction from employees that, that not, no one anticipated, which was, yeah, I'm not gonna work here then. And so, you know, we're seeing right now, I'm calling it, well, I, I'm sure I'm not alone, the great reshuffle. We're, we're seeing turnover like we've never seen before. And people are choosing workplaces and uh, environments that work for them personally as well as professionally 
at a rate I, I would say we've never seen before. And so it'll, it'll settle out again, but it's, it's a very different and unusual environment, I think. Yeah, I think some, in some ways, like it's a power dynamic shift um, and employees in that moment, which I think is a good thing, are finding positions that fit their lives better. Um, I do want to go back to this because selfishly, I'm very interested in the, the who becomes a leader part of it. And as you said, the importance of sports. And that's actually something that I am actively trying to figure out how important is being part of extracurricular, extracurricular activities like being on soccer teams and, you know, in the business club or in part of your theater group in high school. Does it, how, how much does that matter? Um, and I, I tend to side with you that I, I expect that it will matter, but we don't actually know. We don't know if that's the most important thing. Is it really actually once you're in university, which again, there are people in university during COVID who missed maybe those moments. Um, when we look at the literature, like leadership development starts so early on. It's a really, it's a lifespan thing. Um, when you go to kindergarten, you start learning how to interact with people and getting people to like you. So <laughs> did we stunt our kindergartners? I'm not exactly sure, but I think that's part of why I'm led to do the, the research that I am conducting right now. I think it's so interesting and also important to know, like, when does this journey start? What are those critical moments? Do you think it is like you said early, but does it, does it matter more before you get to an organization? Does it matter more what happens once you start working? Is it your first boss? Like, these are some of the questions that I spend time thinking about. Our, our leadership research community spends time thinking about. Well, those are a lot of questions, Julia. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I think Nick might have one. Is that right? Yeah, I was, uh, a number of audience members have sent in some questions, so maybe we could. Uh, I'll, I'll see what we've got here. Um, the first question is about, and and both you, uh, both of you have used the term leader um, as a sort of noun. And one of the one of the questions is, you know, is the term manager synonymous with leader? Um, can a manager show many leadership skills? What are your thoughts on that? I'll let you take that one, Julie, and then I'll give my thoughts. Oh, okay, so I can give the, what I would say is my, my technical, this is how I would answer that question to my undergrads. Um, so those terms are distinct, but can be the same person. So a manager can be a leader, but is not necessarily a leader. Part of that is down to some power differences. So typically management comes with formal power through the job they hold. Whereas a leader can be somebody who doesn't hold formal power, they just hold informal because people respect them, like them, they're, they're willing to be led by them. Um, but really it's a behavioral difference in my mind. So managers are doing much more directive behavior. They're setting expectations, providing resources, um, providing recognition sometimes. But for leaders, to me, it's it's more than that. It's influencing, it's enabling, it's motivating. So a manager can be a leader, but isn't necessarily always, always a leader. That would be my, my initial response. So I'm here to just drive Julie crazy this morning. It's my per personal mission. So I think, you know, it's super gray in my mind. And, you know, I would hope that we're not putting someone in a position to manage that can't lead. And I think that, uh, you know, if I'm asking someone to please manage a group of people, Boy, boy, I sure hope they're leading them. And, and I think that that development comes um, sometimes naturally, sometimes not. And so, you know, to the question earlier today, are leaders born? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I do have a funny, I, I do have a funny story of, uh, and Julie knows this, but when I was uh, receiving the Haskane Business Award, that, that night was really fun. <laughs> Uh, one of my colleagues went up to my mother and said, so, you know, how do you get a kid like that? And my mom just said, without even thinking, you know, she wasn't very bright in high school. And so that has become the story at work, let me tell you. And so um, I, of course, just think it's hilarious. But, you know, when you go back, Julie, to, to you know, what was your past like and what are the traits and, you know, what are the traits of a key leader? And I look around you know, our city, and it's filled with unbelievable, inspirational stories. 
you know, I had all the gifts of great love, uh, you know, wonderful parents, um, not much strife, but we all know women and men that have been through unbelievable challenges and, and not stable backgrounds who have become great leaders of our time. And so, so then, then I question the research somewhat when we say you've got to have these, like these five traits would give you, you know, higher degree of certainty that that person would make a good leader. And I think you should talk about those because um, I think they're interesting. Yeah, well, and I think there's an important distinction to make there. So a lot of what we know about the trait side of this is, is who is more likely to become a leader, not necessarily that they're going to be a good one. Um, so we're, we're pretty good at predicting, well, not pretty good, but we have, we have more of an understanding of who becomes a leader. Uh, there's actually a, a genetic component to this, which I'm not going to suggest that anybody go out and start testing people, uh, you know, do you have the allele that makes you leader? But personality, for instance, is a big, one of the biggest predictors that we know. Um, if you are extroverted, you are more likely to be noticed in leadership selection processes. But because you are an extroverted person has far less of an impact on whether you're an effective leader. So we have some of these traits that we know, all right, intelligence, you're more likely to become a leader. Um, but the relationship between that and how effective you are is much weaker, much less understood. So I don't think we should just consider a set list of, you know, X number of traits and say, all right, we know this about you. Let's put you in a leadership position. Let's put you in a management position. Um, I think it's far more complex that, than that because people are far more complex than that. And what kinds of lived experiences have you had? What kinds of developmental challenges have you faced? Like you said, Andrea, like there are incredible people out there in Calgary who faced really challenging situations and were resilient to them. And how do we get more of those people in leadership roles? Because I do think that there are people who have that same potential who get lost. I think there are people who are from more disadvantaged backgrounds who are not being chosen as leaders because we still have biases in the leadership selection process. Do you agree with that? So I, yeah, I think we're biased for sure. Um, but you hit on one of my favorite words because I really believe resiliency is the key. I think that, um, I don't know why my printer's printing, but sorry for that noise in the background. Um, uh, resiliency, I think is a really key leadership trait in my view. Um, you know, and whether that's about being flexible and nimble and, and learning and, you know, carrying on with, with new data and information. But, uh, you know, I think if we've learned anything in the last two years that is that resiliency has been uh, number one thing. In terms of, uh, you know, DNA, like careful what you, you bring up because now, I, I mean, everybody is seeing this great turnover and so want uh, or reshuffle really wants some certainty in who they're hiring. Like it costs us as employers a lot of money if we don't retain you. And so if the door is just revolving, then, then it's problematic. You know, some search firms um, are doing, you know, pretty complex psycho psychometric testing of sorts, various kinds to see if they can predict with some level of certainty that you're going to be effective in that role. And I mean, you know, there's so much that depends on that. The employer has got to describe the role really accurately and what um, actual traits that the corporation sees are required to be successful. But nonetheless, I mean, search is saying they're pretty serious about it. And so they're, I mean, those are the people that are in the business of how, how are we going to place people in leadership roles, whether that be at the board level or senior management and, and below. And so I think that there's something there. And so to your point of, like, I wouldn't throw out DNA. I think it's going to get to more and more, we're going to want some additional information to make good decisions. Because, um, you know, if you're looking at your bottom line, Julie, it does matter about keeping people and being successful and getting people in the right, in the right seat. This For actually, sure. 
this actually may be a good time to uh, uh, ask you another question from the audience, uh, given what you both have spoken about, about resiliency and the risks and rewards. So for people to take on leadership uh, positions comes with risks and rewards. Uh, so the, the question is, what motivates people to be leaders? Is it money? Is it job satisfaction? Is it the chance to make a difference? Um, why, why, why lead? You know, my bias is, is it's not money. Um, uh, you know, you've got to be treated fairly, in my view, is, is of the utmost importance. But the best leaders I've ever known are motivated to make things better. And so whether that be they really want to engage a, a team of people to accomplish a goal <clears throat> or they want to change the world or, 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 right? Um, so, you know, you could argue really. So I'm in charge of, you know, big corporation downtown Calgary and my, my number one motivation is just to change the world. Well, you know, you talk to some oil and gas leaders and they're pretty motivated that the world needs to understand energy and that the world needs to understand what oil and gas has done in the clean energy space. And they want the world to know how much research has been done to improve our planet because they're known as leaders of, you know, dirty oil. And this industry in our city has done so much for the world. So I think, yes, I think that senior, senior leaders are motivated by many things. And, and that's what makes them great leaders because there's this passion and belief and drive that we, are, we as a human race are, are capable of doing great things. And I think that, I mean, you think about the people that come immediately to mind when you think, amazing life-changing leaders you know that nelson mandela like you could go on and on and on they weren't motivated by money or traditional things they were motivated by core values um and wanted people to come with them on that journey my view and i think that's that's sort of an ideal right you want leaders who are motivated by the ability to elevate others, to make a difference, to they have the meaningfulness in that, that position. The research would say that that's not all leaders <laughs> um, and that there are a range of reasons for why people become leaders in organizations from some people seeking the power, right? Some people seeking the money, there are, there are people who do that. I also think there's this organizational system that we have set up not in all organizations, again, um, but when you look broadly across industries, one of the ways to get a higher status role, to get more money, is to get promoted into a management position. We don't often have roles where people can <laughs> rise through the ranks as an individual contributor because they're very good at the technical thing that they do. Um, and so I think there's actually a bit of a broken system within some industries around what's motivating people to become leaders. It's for some people because that's absolutely what they're driven to. And those people tend to be the better leaders, to be the amazing leaders because they find something meaningful in the role. They want to work with people and, and develop others. And, and other people get put in those roles. And these are the people who are maybe more managers who aren't great leaders. They get put in management positions for reasons that wouldn't set them up to be great leaders, right? So it is for the for the raise, it is for the, the higher title. Um, and I think, I don't know if you've seen that as well, if you agree that that's happening, not necessarily with top level, but if you look across the board of organizations. Well, you know, it, it, you bring up something else. And so maybe, maybe yes, maybe no, uh, would be my answer to that. I think that in highly technical fields, if you're good at what you do, you get promoted. And my poke at the education system would be, we don't necessarily put enough leadership in our base degrees, teaching and, and uh, tools. So if I look at myself, I'm a nurse. And so I was a pretty good nurse. And so, you know, the next thing you, you find yourself in, in it is in a management role. 
and I didn't know what I was doing. And so then I went back to school to try and get additional knowledge to make myself a better leader or a better manager, perhaps at that time. And so I, I lacked the, the tools. I was a good nurse. I was technically very good at it. And I think that that happens in engineering. I, like I could go on almost every single discipline. I think that that is not an uncommon thing to happen. And then what we ended up end up with in workplaces is a lot of people in leadership or management roles that don't necessarily have the skills. And I don't think that's uncommon. And so then you've got workplaces trying to create leadership um, support infrastructure to help us move our people along. And it would be great, I think, if leadership was taught uh, more intentionally at, at lower levels. So right back to the beginning of this conversation, Julie, maybe it's about um, you know team sport. I was not a team sport kid. I was an individual, individual, uh, uh, you know, that my sports were all swimming and coaching and um, yeah, individual contributor versus versus a, on, a, on a bigger team. And so I don't know, well, you know, I don't know what the difference is. I don't know what the research says about that. But if you if you think about all the things that 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 come along, what, what did that teach you when you were on yes. a soccer team? What what you know, what did first year of, of university teach you when you were finally independent for the first time? I don't, you know, I think all of these things in our lives, um, you know, create who we, who we become. But I do think we've got an issue with technical expertise and in, ending up in, in leadership roles without adequate support. I agree. It's when does training happen? And so I, I want to say, you don't have to be a soccer player or a hockey player to become a great leader. And there are, there are other spaces earlier on in your life that you can, you can gain those experiences. Um, and I do think that at university level, we can, we can be even more intentional about giving our students those experiences. But I also think organizations can can start training people before people are in leadership roles. I think this is another way that organizations haven't yet optimized. Yeah. It costs money though. It does. So, you know, I think that it, from my perspective, we all need to help one another. And I'm not, you know, when I say I poke it at the university, I'm poking at education because I think that, you know, we need to teach very early a different way of thinking and problem solving and resiliency and uh, complex decision making and all of those things um, contribute to leadership in my view. What do we what do we know about leadership training? Both of you have spoken about the challenges that leaders face and the, what organizations should do. do. Do we know anything systematic about how to train leaders, leaders in leadership? The research would suggest that leadership is trainable, um, that it can be done, but to Andrew's point, it isn't easy. It is something that takes time. And if you're gonna do it well, it was something that would cost because it is something that should involve a few different aspects. It should involve some, some experiential learning, right? So there has to be some knowledge transfer and some maybe demonstration of, of positive leadership behaviors. And then really the most important part is that there's time for people to actually practice and get feedback. And that's now much harder, right? So it's okay. It's one thing to send people away for here's a weekend. Let's learn about some positive leadership behaviors. Let's help you see yourself as a leader. It's very different to then say, go practice this, reflect on it, seek feedback, have mentorship around this. That's a much longer process. It's a more expensive process, but it's a much more effective process to actually have that training be impactful. That. You know, I, I think it's a really tough one. When I think about more senior training I've done in, in my life, um, a lot of it has been about case study. So even, you know, I spent a week at Harvard, not that, not the, you know, longer, probably likely far more effective uh, leadership training for senior people there, but it was just a week long training that I did. And they literally just put you in cohorts. I know you're very familiar with this. In fact, Haskin does this with ICD a lot. So if you look at the ICD training, I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty obvious stuff, right? You, do, you get into cohort, you get an interesting case, um, you work together. Uh, and so there's the whole dynamic of the, 
the team function and and leadership within that team and you you know compromise and challenge and and come to um, a conclusion it's it's just in the workplace it's um it's a lot to do and a lot to invest um when the outcomes are not entirely clear and so i think that you know as an employer what you struggle with is where do you invest that resource and and frankly monetary support at what level at what time and can you prove that you're actually getting uh, return on that investment and so that's why i think it will take a village to do this effectively and so we'll have to work together um, with education and others and whether it's sport or or you know volunteerism like it, it, you're quite right julie it comes from multiple multiple sources but for me it's not one thing it's it's uh from you know you learn i i think you learn just as much from a bad leader as you do from a good you know because then you sort yourself out about who you want to be and don't want to be more importantly but i think that it's a combination of education yes on the job yes and support from within your your uh workplace but we've got to be more intentional i think early on in education one of one of the things oh, an audience member uh vanessa hebrook raised the question does leadership or do leadership styles uh, or, sk or skills differ by generations both of you have spoken about you know, training, Andrea, you've seen this over decades of, of work. Um, Julie, you're you're aware of the research. Um, are there generational differences in, in, in leadership? Nick, are you calling me old? <laughs> <laughs> Merely experienced, Andrea. Uh, yes, sure. Huge, huge. And I think that's good. So again, you know, once again, do we want uh, a homogenous workplace? No. We, you know, do we want everybody rowing in the same direction for sure, but how we get there, in my view, uh, the more different we are in terms of leadership, the better off. And so, it, you know, it, when I sit and look at our executive team, for example, um, none of us are the same, thank goodness. It makes it uh, challenging sometimes because we all have a completely different view, but um, but very necessary if we're gonna meet the needs of all the generations that work with us. And so if we have leaders that are all leading the same, uh, you know, Julie, you said right away off the top here, um, that's good that people are leaving their jobs and finding the right thing for them personally. And, and as the employer, you're like, hey, okay, <laughs> but we got work to do. And, um, and so, yeah, we need to be flexible in our in our workplace and i think we have been but at the end of the day we've got work to get accomplished and um and you know 100 flexibility is not going to get it done and so i think that yes that the generations lead com completely differently that's good um because our, our our employees need different levels of support here's where i, I can drive you oh okay go ahead i drive can drive crazy. you crazy and say that research would at least indicate that that's not actually the case that it, there there aren't complete di generational differences um there are some but it's they're they're not totally different worlds uh, and that really at the end of the day the core positive leadership behaviors are the same whether you're a brand new 24 year old grad or you're the ceo and you're you know like those behaviors are actually the same and, and even what some people want. So it may be communicated differently and there might be different skills and language around that, but really the behaviors aren't that different generationally. Really? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so the research would say there aren't huge differences. I mean, and, it's been researched to death, right? I mean, which generation has which traits and you don't think that that has significant influence on how you show up in the workplace? I think that there are differences, but they're not different worlds. And I think part of it is that you're just at different stages of your life. Um, so it's not about a generation, it's just what stage you're at um, and what experiences you've had. 
and maybe it'll become more pronounced after COVID, right? Like the people who have had that, have lived through that crisis early on in their lives, maybe will be more impacted by that, but there aren't clear like, oh, well, Gen Z lead this way and millennials and boomers lead these way. Like it really isn't that distinct. And that really at the end of the day, good leadership is good leadership and bad, bad leadership is also bad leadership. Um, if you're, you know, putting people down, if you're overlooking them, if you're not giving them consistent information, it, it doesn't really matter what generation you're in. If the leadership would say, like the leadership research would say, that's bad leadership. Now, how inclined certain people are to display those forms of leadership, I'm not exactly, I couldn't say, oh, well, this generation is X percent more likely to be, you know, transformational versus abusive. I'm not sure what that breakdown is, but there's less of a difference when you look across the board. Than so people I, you know, I, I do believe you. I don't think it's an entirely different world, but I do think that, you know, we all get stuck in our ways and uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult to see another, a different point of view. And if we don't have um, people that are expressing that point of view so that you can change your processes and practices in the workplace, then you'll end up in trouble. And so, you know, it's just about being, you know, you, you get tunnel vision when everyone around you thinks the same way. And part of that is generational, um, not, not in its entirety. But I think that we, we all struggle in, in organizations. If you look at board tables around um, the country, they're pretty old. And so, you know, I can say that, Nick, because you called me old and I'm one of those old people on, 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 on boards. And it is a little bit of a concern because it, it's the one aspect that you're not seeing, right? Because the and boards are not representative of um, the corporations that they uh, represent necessarily. And so, and that's also true in leadership, right? We still are profoundly white and privileged um, and that's not also not okay. And so, you know, we're not, we're not open nor seeing um, the perspective perspectives of our employees. And so, uh, you know, there's lots and lots that needs to be progressed and fixed here. I couldn't agree with you more on that part, the importance of diversity of thought and experience. Yes. And so, so what, what do we do about that? Um, uh, Jim DeWald raises the question in the chat about um, the representation of women um, in leadership positions uh, in terms of board diversity um, and the uh, and he's in his in his chat said it says it's it's enough talk time for action so what do we do well you know one of the things uh we're considering doing is do you create a shadow board position for a young up-and-coming leader and uh, you know so they may not be experienced enough to be voting member of that board but could you have them on in a different way there's shadow cabinets all over the place for do you have a shadow cabinet to help you do respond to an RFP? And do you, are you looking at it openly enough to, to actually bid on business to having a shadow, um, a, an entire shadow board for a purpose? I think that there's opportunity there. I think that, um, you know, we have made some movement, Jim, on, on women on boards. Uh, you know, th that exists in Calgary. It's an actual association and group of, of um, a, a group has come together and created this company that's looking at just that. Uh, can we encourage and help women get on boards? And, you know, they've had some su success. And, uh, and I think that those kind of initiatives are action and are working. Um, but I think that, that, that more needs to happen. And I think, you know, for me, when I give advice to, to people who are really interested in advancing their career, they're really simple things like take the opportunities, walk through that door, take a risk. Those things are hard, it takes courage, but there are, I've never felt discriminated against as a woman. I've never felt that I didn't get an opportunity because of my gender. 
Um, I might be unusual in that, but I think that um, there is a great deal of opportunity for all of us. Um, I worry a little bit more on the diversity angle, more, more than gender. I think that we're less and less representative of the community that we live in. And so, you know, I think that that is probably the same mechanisms, um, but it is who you know. And so if I go to a, an event with women, it tends to be the same women and we need to bring in new and younger um, females if it's, a, if, it's, if, if it's that gender focused, but more diverse as well. And, uh, and economically diverse. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that's a really important distinction here is that we need to consider the role, like nepotism is still alive and well. Um, and you're right, like it's within, there are certain groups of women who are helping each other and but there are people who are being left out of those kinds of groups as well. Um, and so looking at who's getting put into these roles and. And is it because of characteristics that aren't necessary for the board? Is it because you engage in similar activities, you know similar people? And can we look more broadly and consider like people who maybe aren't your typical applicants, right? So it's it's having this open-mindedness that lets people onto boards and gain experience or shadow boards, which I think is an excellent idea. Can you let people in who maybe don't look like everyone else in terms of not just their like physical appearance, but their backgrounds, their interests, who they know? I think that's a really important thing for people at the top to be to be trying to be aware of their own unconscious biases around this. Um, people, we you know, with resume studies, you look at these things. You, you can take names off of resumes. You can have no gendered information, but people look at the kinds of activities that people uh, have done. They look at the schools they've attended and you use that information to guide you as well, right? You make judgments about people that can then disadvantage people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And you've now limited yourself in terms of diversity. And I think it is too then important to go all the way down with this sort of like back to the importance of early, early development. Are we giving everyone and equal as much of an equal chance as we can to see themselves as leaders when they're 20 years old because we need those 20 year olds to see themselves as leaders so that someday they take those risks that you're suggesting Andrea and say I'm willing like I'm ready put me on a shadow board put me on a board itself so I think it's like two ends have to do things that are different top and and bottom you know one of my one of my favorite stories it's a long long time ago uh and I mean long time because Nick, I am old. So I was probably 30 years ago. We had a female neurosurgeon in town and she was having, um, she, she was having a dinner party with all of her neurosurgery buddies. So everyone's coming to the door and her uh, three-year-old daughter is helping her um, answer the door. And so everybody comes in and her, her daughter looks confused. And so Marie looks at her and says, what's up? And she said, well, mommy, I didn't know that boys could be neurosurgeons, right? I love that story. But, um, and then just changing topics and something else you said, Julie, just a, a sidebar, uh, a challenge to everybody, just go on and Google uh, unconscious bias tools, you'll find one and take the test. It's pretty fascinating. So I'd say, uh, you know, I am a pretty experienced leader and I did a series of them and I was shocked. So the things that I thought I had no bias, no bias whatsoever, I do. And so then to have that, and then it, it just led to a discussion and then we actually did it as a leadership team, um, just a series, we chose a couple and then uh, all took the test and then just sat around and challenged each other. Actually, I do see that in you. And so, you know, so how does that play out when you when you deal with people? So I really think that there's, I mean, there's a million things, whether it's a personality test or, you know, how you typically approach things, whether it's, and you know them all, there's a million tools that you can take that will say, 
you know, half of our leadership team are more people focused or more, you know, results focused, and that's helpful. But I think this unconscious bias piece is a little more flavor to understand how you actually lean into things and bring people forward. Yeah, so being willing to put some systems around that, right? Like, all right, we we are all people who make not perfectly rational decisions. So how can we set up the system to help us make more rational or more diverse decisions? Do we indicate we need these kinds of people and we go out and seek them and allow for for different experiences that that can work as well, right? Like very intentional search around this. Um, and again, it needs to happen, not just at board level, like this should be happening kind of across leadership levels and organizations. Um, well, you know, as a new leader, like I, I, I just think, so it's, it's so simple, right? But what is your singular greatest strength? So for me, um, that might be how passionately I express my opinion, but it's also my Achilles heel. So I know that I come across strongly, like I have no room, I believe so clearly in what, in what I'm trying to get across to you, Julie, that the, there's no way I could change my mind, uh, which couldn't be further from the truth. But because of the way I put things across, um, sometimes people feel like they can't disagree with me. And so I know that of me. And so when I communicate with others, I need to talk about that quite a bit. Um, that given different data or a different perspective, I will change my mind. And so, but if I don't express that, then I actually don't get uh, the full picture of anything. And so I think that knowing yourself really well, and so whether that's the unconscious bias piece or simply what do you do better than anybody and what's the downside of that um, will lead you to, I think, a better understanding and will make you a better leader. It requires vulnerability. For can sure. We, can, we, can we talk about the future? Uh, a number of people in the, in the chat have raised issues about uh, the need for leadership and increased uncertainty or um you know uh what 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 do different forms of organization like hierarchical forms need um sort of along the lines of in this changing world so i wondered if each of you could describe your sense of what the future of leadership is and i think there's a difference here in terms of like the behaviors that you need and then the medium through which we're asking leaders to engage in leadership. I think that's something that a lot of current leaders are grappling with is that more and more leadership is happening like this, or it's happening through people's emails. Um, and we don't think about that, right? These small leadership behaviors, like that really does include the emails that you send your team that send, like that includes the Slack messages and team messages that you send. Um, and how do you motivate people over Zoom versus in person? And so I think, in some ways, again, those core, can you motivate people? Can you express your values and act consistently with your values? Can you care about people as individuals and want to help them develop, think creatively? Like those kinds of leadership behaviors are still needed. Um, but how are you going to express them in this hybrid world, in this fully online remote world where you're not really ever with your team? That is a is a big difference. And and trying to keep yourself from being too directive because that's much easier. It's much easier to send an email. Here's what I need done. Go do it. I'll give you, you know, I'll let you know when it's complete. Like that's the directive behavior that you're kind of inclined to in this setting. So I would say the medium is a really important thing to be intentional about. Yeah, so I'd say I have failed. <laughs> so I am the queen of one line email response. No. <laughs> Maybe. So it, and I know it's not helpful and I know it drives everybody crazy. Like I, I am way, way, way too brief. And so I've not morphed and changed like I should have through this, through this time. So uh, my bad entirely. So I think that, I think you've got a great point there, Julie, honest, you know, future of leadership, flat organizations, hierarchical organizations, what I'm really seeing 
um, and I think will be leading us for a long time to come, is people need to be, we've probably always known it, but I think we've never known it more than now. You need to be value aligned with the organization, the work that you do. And if you are not value aligned or your morals are, are being tested by um, how that organization is running, you will leave and you should leave. And I really do mean that. So if you land in a place that doesn't feel right, then get out because it's unlikely going to get any better for you. Um, you know, I think that flattened organizations have benefit. I think bottom line and fundamentally, people want um, to be led sounds uh, wrong. They want clarity of direction. And so sometimes, you know, that's a little hierarchical. Um, to get there can be done very, very efficiently in a flat organization, it can. And so I think that the big thing going forward is more of this evolution and uh, being nimble and resiliency and the things that I was talking about earlier. But it is going to continue to evolve, I think, on a, on a big scale. And I think that uh, we all, you know, we spend a lot of our life at work. And so you want it to be deep, deeply, I think, meaningful to you. And so, Julie, to your point, deeply meaningful to me might be making a whole bunch of money. Or it might be um, deeply meaningful to me uh, to be working in an organization of, of great meaning. And so, I, I, but I do think you need to be value aligned. And, uh, and that has become super clear to me. And I think there's this interesting, again, back to the levels. So value aligned with your organization, yes. But day to day, what you feel more is are you value aligned with your leader? And so hopefully your leader is value aligned with the organization. And so there's a natural fit there. Um, but what you're gonna experience is what kinds of values are your leader displaying? How are they behaving? And if there isn't a fit with your leader, even though you might love the, the meaning of the organization, the vision of the organization, it, it still won't be a fit, right? People leave leaders, bad leaders. They don't leave organizations necessarily. Um, and so that's really important as a, as a leader to be aware of this is that yes, sure, you can work for this organization has the most important, most meaningful mandate. But if you are not making those values clear within your team, if you are expressing different values, if you're expressing different ethical norms, um, that's what matters. That's what people are gonna really experience. And so fit with organization as well as, as fit with leader. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just think so much of leadership uh, is showing up. And so I think that, you know, you don't have to say much uh, in times of crisis, or in times of stress, um, but being present is maybe the biggest gift you can give as a leader um, when the people that you work with are struggling. And, uh, you know, every, people will say leadership by walking around and call it a million different things. But because we've been separate, and so Julie, to your point, we have to figure out, I clearly have to figure out <laughs> how to show up and be present in more than a one line email. Yeah, the power of recognition, mm -hmm. which is, is sort of like, there's like the management level, like, yes, I recognize you completed the tasks that you did, but like recognizing people as individuals who have unique needs and then working with them to try and meet those needs, right? Like, so you, you're, you were aware of them and then you actually put in effort towards, towards developing, towards elevating them. And you're right, it's such, it can be such small, small behaviors. And it's, it's also something that can be done daily. It should be thought of as something that's done on a consistent basis. Maybe, right, there's variance in terms of how frequently people interact with their leaders, but it's not a once a year, twice a year grand speech where you recognize people and talk about why they're important to the team, but it's like this consistent showing up in small actions that I think is really critical. And again, I don't think that that's that different now versus, you know, pre-COVID or this generation, last generation. I think it's just that you're having to do it a little more intentionally when it is online, when you are remote. 
So the intentionality of being consistent and, and being present. Well, you know, uh, I know someone on the screen might soon be a mother. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that that's a privilege, right? Yes. So it is, it is a great privilege and responsibility to lead. And so you, you know, we all have to take that pretty seriously. We affect a lot of human beings in some, in some ways completely unintentionally by a, a nod or a, a one-line email that might not be effective can, can have great impact. And so, um, so we need to be thinking about how to be better leaders every day. Um, and that takes a lot of energy. It's important. It does. Yeah. And, and some people will be more naturally inclined to it, be more naturally skilled at it, but just because it's not your natural inclination, like, again, you can, you can work at these things and get better at them. This is a skill that you can, you can develop, which is, I think a really important takeaway. Like you're not just stuck as the leader you are today. And this is something that you can, you can get better at. Well, thank you both. And that's, I think, a, a good uh, place to end. I mean, this idea that leadership is something that can be developed. Um, you both have covered lots. I mean, the motivations of leaders, um, why people lead, how we go about training leaders. Um, I think we've had a really um, wide ranging conversation today. And I, I thank also the audience for the questions, which I think help to really feed this. Um, I think I'll now turn it over to, to Sandy to wrap up. That was so interesting. I didn't want it to stop. Um, it was funny, Andrea, that your mom didn't think you had the capacity to be a leader in high school. <laughs> it's a great reminder that we aren't all born leaders. And we heard, as we heard from Julie, we can teach and develop leadership skills. And organizations have to take an active role in developing leaders early on. I want to thank the audience for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll be emailing you a survey and we want to really and we would really appreciate it if you would just take a few moments to fill it out. Our next tasking hour will be early in 2023 and I look forward to seeing everyone then. In the meantime, have a great Friday and a wonderful weekend.